I'm Judd Myers. I'm Scott Tipton. Welcome to Blast Off. Greetings, everyone, and a happy Thanksgiving to one and all. Scott Tipton here, your co-host for a brand new edition of the Blast Off Podcast. First up, in this week's Comics 101, we look back at the beginnings of DC's Justice League of America. Then, Judd tells the tale of the day he wore the shield in All of Us Hallow. Let's get right to it. The history of comic books, the characters you love, and the people who created them. This is Scott Tipton's Comics 101. If it worked before, it'll work again. That was what DC Comics editor Julius Schwartz must have been thinking in late 1959 as he prepared to debut the latest feature in his burgeoning line of superhero titles. He had already successfully revived The Flash and Green Lantern in the anthology book Showcase. So what next? The choice for Schwartz was easy. A revival of one of the biggest success stories for national comics in the 1940s, The Justice Society of America. However, Schwartz wasn't crazy about the name. As he explained to the in-house DC fan magazine, Amazing World of DC Comics number 14, in March 1977. To me, society meant something I found on Park Avenue. I felt that league was a stronger word, one that readers could identify with because of baseball leagues. The revamped team, the Justice League of America, or the JLA, would solidify DC Comics' full-time return to the superhero business. Its success would not only herald the introduction of scores of superhero titles at DC, but also inspired DC's rival Martin Goodman at Marvel to instruct Stan Lee to create their own superhero team, thereby kick-starting the Marvel Universe. While the name was changed, the basic concept was not. So who then would be drafted into Schwartz's new JLA? Schwartz's new rising stars, The Flash and Green Lantern, were a given. Wonder Woman still had her own solo magazine, so she was in. Aquaman was nestled into a monthly spot backing up Superboy in Adventure Comics, so he got the call. And also, John Jones, the Martian Manhunter. Who's that, you ask? John Jones, the Pete Best of the Justice League. John a.k.a. the Martian Manhunter, was a holdover from the sci-fi craze in comics in the late 1950s. Premiering as a backup feature in Detective Comics number 225, Jean is a Martian accidentally teleported to Earth by the well-intentioned, if somewhat skittish scientist, Professor Mark Erdell, who drops dead from shock at the sight of the newly arrived Martian. Stranded on Earth, Jean anglicizes his name to the more American-sounding John Jones and uses his Martian abilities to shape change into a human. Jean works as a police detective and uses his Martian powers on the job in superheroic fashion. And there are quite a few of those powers. Aside from the shape changing, Jean is super strong and can fly, turn invisible, and read minds. Plus, there is his ill-defined and infrequently used Martian vision, and Martian breath. Jean's major fallibility is that he is extremely vulnerable to fire. At the time Justice League of America was getting started, Jean Jones had appeared as a six-page feature in Detective Comics for more than five years, thus earning him a spot on the team. Unfortunately, the Martian Manhunter would be written out of JLA by the time Hanna-Barbera premiered the Saturday morning TV series Super Friends, its animated version of the Justice League, in 1973. Legions of young comics fans would later pick up old Justice League comics and ask, who's the bald green guy? But what about the two biggest guns in DC's arsenal, Superman and Batman? Initially, 
there is some resistance to the inclusion of the big two in Schwartz's new league, namely from Superman editor Mort Weisner and Batman editor Jack Schiff. They argued that Superman's and Batman's inclusion might overexpose the heroes and negatively affect sales, so the three editors compromised. Superman and Batman would be included in the league as full members, but with smaller roles in the adventures, often busy in outer space or on other missions, and would not appear on the cover. Schwartz diplomatically handled the inevitable questions from fans asking about Superman's and Batman's absence. He wrote in the first JLA letter column that these two popular heroes appear in so many other DC magazines that we thought it would be more appropriate to play up the other members. This policy continued throughout the series' first year until DC higher-ups, noticing the absence of the two on JLA covers, intervened. On orders from upstairs, Superman and Batman took part in more adventures and were featured more prominently on the covers. In assembling his creative team, Schwartz brought on Gardner Fox, longtime writer of the original comic book super team, the Justice Society of America. Back in the 1940s, Fox had helped establish a sturdy formula of the team book, in which the JSA would gather at the beginning of the issue when a threat appeared, break up into solo or smaller group adventures, and then reunite for the grand finale. And no need to mess with a good thing. This successful framework would continue for countless JLA stories, both by Fox and his many successors. For the art, Schwartz selected Mike Sikowski, whose art is far from flashy, but contains a crude brilliance that is a perfect fit for the title, simultaneously futuristic and fairy tale simple. Sikowski's figures weren't the most heroically cut. Sometimes, the Justice League looked more like a bunch of middle-aged businessmen dressed up for a Kiwanis Club masquerade party. His backgrounds were usually sparsely detailed, and occasionally, his anatomy could get a little, shall we say, creative. Still, Sikowski's Justice League of America looked like nothing else on the rack at the time. The fact that the League members looked less flashy and polished in the pages of Justice League of America compared to their own solo books helped to break out the series as its own animal. Schwartz scheduled Justice League for a three-issue tryout in the pages of another of DC's anthology books, The Brave and the Bold, debuting issue number 28 in March 1960. The Justice League of America faces off against the alien threat of Starro the Conqueror in the logically named story, Starro the Conqueror. Schwartz and Fox dispense with an origin story and instead drop the reader into the action at a point after the League has already been in service long enough to have handed out signal devices and constructed a secret headquarters. At the start of the story... A friendly pufferfish warns Aquaman of the arrival of a mysterious giant starfish from outer space. Calling himself Starro, the giant starfish has changed three local starfish into duplicates of himself and declared his intention to conquer the planet. Concerned, Aquaman summons his fellow Justice League members to convene at headquarters to discuss the matter, with the glaring exception of Superman and Batman. Superman is off stopping a meteor shower and Batman is tracking down two suspiciously vague arch enemies, which sounds to me like an excuse to get out of League dinner plans. The League members split up to handle Starro's three starfish deputies, and soon the Flash discovers Starro's main power, aside from being, well, a really big starfish. It's mind control. Starro's deputy has mentally enslaved the entire population of Happy Harbor, Rhode Island, except for one person, the teen hipster Snapper Carr, who remains mysteriously immune. After Flash defeats the giant starfish, he heads off to confront Starro, with the annoying Snapper in tow. Snapper, of course, received his nickname for his incessant habit of snapping his fingers for appreciation of anything he likes. Charming, but that must have got old fast. The reassembled Justice League attacks Starro, who is much more formidable than his invertebrate underlings, having mentally received all the knowledge and experience from their individual battles with the League. 
Starro reads Green Lantern's mind and discovers his weakness against Yellow, then changes his skin color to render Geo's ring useless. To find out why Snapper is immune to Starro's mind control, the Flash performs a quick chemical analysis and detects traces of lime on Snapper's clothes. And by the way, who knew sprinkling lime on the lawn was a necessary chore back in the 1960s? They gather several barrels of lime, and Green Lantern encases Starro in a hardened shell of lime, helpfully applied by Jean Jones in a rare use of his Martian breath. Once Starro is defeated, the Justice League rewards Stepper Carr for essentially standing around and doing nothing, declaring him an honorary member of the League and giving him a JLA signal device. Little do they know that their kind gesture of pity to a clearly troubled young man will result in this punk's practically living in the JLA's secret sanctuary for the next five years. Not surprisingly, the first three-issue Justice League run in Brave and the Bold was a big success, leading to the first issue of its own series, Justice League of America, two months later in November of 1960. Unlike Marvel's Avengers series, which boasted a fluid, rotating membership as one of its strengths for decades, the hallmark of Justice League of America was stability. Members weren't added easily or haphazardly, and by and large, once the hero joined up, he generally stayed, with very few exceptions. As a result, membership in the Justice League seemed far more exclusive and impressive. This was the top echelon of the DC Universe, the absolute best the company had to offer. Over at Marvel, sometimes it seemed like anybody who hung around the mansion long enough could become an Avenger, but if a character was inducted into the JLA, it meant that that character wasn't going anywhere and that readers would be most likely seeing them steadily for years to come. Let's take a look at the full roster of the original Justice League of America. Following the original Big Seven, DC's battling bowman the Green Arrow was the league's first recruit, followed at fairly regular intervals over the next 20 years by the size-changing hero of the Atom, the winged wonder Hawkman, the blonde bombshell known as Black Canary, the stretchable sleuth known as the Elongated Man, Red Tornado, the android with a heart, Hawkman's wife and crime-fighting partner Hawkgirl, the sorceress Zatanna the Magician, and the atomic powerhouse called Firestorm the Nuclear Man. And there you have it, the Justice League of America. For my money, the single best roster for a superhero team in comics. Maybe the Avengers had more fun and different combinations, and the X-Men may have been better written at times, and the Legion may have had them beat by sheer numbers, but this is the team to which all others are compared. It's got everything. Sheer muscle in Superman and Wonder Woman. Raw power in Green Lantern and Firestorm. Specialists like the Atom, Flash, Aquaman, Zatanna, Black Canary, and the Elongated Man. Mere mortals who get by on sheer skill and willpower like Batman and Green Arrow. And lost souls looking for a new home like John Jones, the Hawks, and the Red Tornado. Most of all, it's got pedigree. It's got stature. It's got presence. In the two-plus decades since this first Justice League team disbanded, there have been numerous JLA lineups, some more popular than others. The more popular versions, it seems, are the ones that emulate this original model, the most powerful, important characters in the company. Even with that in mind, nothing has come close in our minds to the symbolic might of this first pantheon. Other teams were just superheroes. Back in the day, at least through the eyes of this 10-year-old kid, the Justice League of America felt like legends. Not all great stories happen in the pages of a comic book. Some of them happen in the store. Welcome to Judd Meyer's Retails.
Merriam-Webster Dictionary Hallow Verb 1. To make holy 2. To respect greatly It's another All Hallows Eve. The city of angels is buzzing, laughing, honking their horns. They've put the finishing touches on their ghosts and ghouls and goblins. No pagans here, folks, just role players and revelers congratulating one another on their creativity and imagination. The echo of children's laughter, pillowcases filled with sugar as they run up and down dimly lit streets. This really is their holiday, isn't it? Year after year, the veil descends on our country, and the question is asked, what are you going as this year? And after, there were a lot of jokers out there tonight, weren't there? Recently, We've experienced the joy and wonder of the cosplay explosion. At conventions all over the world, it's an endless Halloween celebration. A holiday caught in amber. Thousands of fans, every age, race, gender, displaying the costume they spent a whole year creating. Robots transforming into cars and gender-bending versions of every hero and villain lifted from comic books' four-color pages. It really is remarkable. Little Judd, on his huffy, would never have imagined it. Riding in the Robin suit his mom sewed together for him, racing to the comic book store where the costume contest was underway. Sure, he would win the $25 prize. Sure, he would be the best one there, and crying silently when he was beat by the boy in the Spider-Man suit. It was terrible, and falling off of his body, but the fact was he was a gymnast at the local junior high school. Backflips and doing the splits just wasn't a part of this Robin's arsenal. When we were young, it was easy to pretend we were pirates and princesses, cowboys and queens. Boys could wear dresses and lipstick and no one would say boo. Girls could bravely display their blasters and holler, Hold on, Chewy! and revel in the safety of the night. No judgment on this special day. The only rule is that you transform into someone else. Someone other than who you wake up to in the mirror every day. Little legs skipping on sidewalks, safe with their parents beside them. Race you to the next house, they shout. Don't run, cry their parents, knowing they won't listen. Running, cheering, playing the universal game. The one we all know the rules to. Which is to say, the one that has no rules. The game of pretend. I think about all of these things. I hear the running and the echoes outside, and my mind drifts to quiet, fluorescent hallways. Rooms with seas of beds and rolling chairs. Rooms packed with small legs that can't run. Mouths unable to shout. Little bodies that can't pretend with the other boys and girls outside. Little minds that can't imagine their way out of illness. They can't look in the mirror and make themselves into someone anyone else. I think back to the most important Halloween I've ever had, the day I stepped into a costume bigger than myself. So much bigger. The day I became Captain America. For many years now, our store has used Halloween as an excuse to do some good. We have a vast network of cosplayers, a kind, selfless, generous army. Folks who sometimes understand the nature of doing good even more than the heroes in the comic books on our racks. We order thousands of comic books, and we send out our troops into the hallways of our local children's hospitals, bringing comic books, tricks, and treats to the legs that can't run and jump in the night air with the rest of the city. Batman, Wonder Woman, Spider-Man, and Supergirl, invoking surprise and wonder. Stormtroopers gently holding tiny hands while their owners shriek with delight. The sounds echo in the hallways, the way they do in the streets below, and the doctors and nurses let the children own the moment. A brief respite in what is, for some, a long and weary battle. Usually, we let the kids in on a secret. We tell them a special guest will be coming to the hospital for the festivities. Maybe it's Iron Man, maybe Wonder Woman. Last year, it was Captain America. The nurses whispered about it for weeks, and the children's excitement grew and grew right up until the big day. 
Captain America was coming to visit them. The real one? they asked. Yes, the real one, was the reply. Months earlier, I'd reached out to one of our faithful customers. He's a hulk of a man who trains many of those actors who spend time on your local movie screens. The ones who shout, Avengers Assemble! in their perfect costumes, with their perfect muscles and their perfect hair. He'd spent some of his disposable income on having a Captain America suit built to his specifications by one of the costumers on the Disney Studios payroll. Even the shield was made of steel and hand-painted. It was heavy as an anvil, with leather straps and gear to carry it on his back. Needless to say, I was as excited as the children. This guy was going to knock their socks off. And then the phone rang. I'm so sorry, man. You know I want to be there for the kids, but there's an A-list actor who needs me for 48 hours, and he's flying in from Australia tomorrow. I can't say no. But, I stammered, but they're expecting Captain America. You've got time, he replied. I'll give you the costume, and you can find another guy to step in. Easy. Do you have any idea how difficult it is to find Steve Rogers in Los Angeles? In 24 hours? It's nearly impossible. Sure, there are stereotypes on every corner. Guys with all of the muscles and wicked good looks. Guys with the height and the gait. Sure, they could fill the costume, but be worthy of the man inside? A tall, tall order. The clock ticked and time began slipping through my fingers. The next morning was creeping up, unsympathetic to the coming disaster. I sat on the floor, dejected. I was going to end up the villain in this story. The breaker of children's hearts. I glared at myself in the mirror, growling at my reflection, deep baritone curses echoing off the walls. And then I tilted my head up, down, side to side. I stood up and faced myself in the mirror. I puffed out my chest and stood on my tiptoes, and I caught a glimmer of something in that mirror. A glimmer of hope. Could I actually pull this off? I hadn't been clean-shaven in over a decade. The white creeping into parts of my beard were unstoppable. What did I look like under those weeds? I'm certainly no Steve Rogers. I long ago realized that I'd never have blonde hair and blue eyes. I'm also miles removed from looking like a soldier from any season, spring or winter. But damn it, someone needed to fight the good fight. There were kids to save. I broke out my razor shoved my face in the sink, and staged a midnight facial assault. In no time at all, the deed was done. Again, I looked at myself in the mirror. Again, I tilted my head side to side. Again, a glimmer. I stuck my feet into the army pants and tugged and rolled and tied. I punched three new holes in the belt and cinched it so tight it held my small belly at bay. I broke out my biggest hiking boots and stuffed as many inserts inside as I could. And then I put on the battle coat and was amazed to find that I looked like Beetlejuice, a tiny shrunken head swimming in a sea of leather. So the stuffing began. I zipped the coat closed and shoved shirts and socks and sweaters in the arms. I wrapped a towel around my waist and pushed and shoved until some semblance of musculature appeared. Slowly I turned, inch by inch, the light gleaming off the small bald spot at the back of my head. I tied a bandana around my skull and squeezed the helmet on. Close. So close. And then I looked down. The thing on the floor called up to me, intimate and low. You dare to put on the suit, you'd better be brave enough to wield the shield. I picked it up, strapped my arm into the holster, and stared in disbelief. I was Captain America. Not the Captain America. More like a sort of Captain America, but it would have to do. I stuck my head out the window and cried into the warm night air, Avenger Assembled! I drove my car into the hospital parking structure, making sure to find the most inconspicuous spot I could. There was no way I could suit up in the hospital bathroom. This procedure was way too complicated, and I couldn't have anyone asking questions. 
I popped the trunk and began the process. Tug, roll, tie, stack, slip, zip, bind, stuff, 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 stuff. I slid the helmet onto my head, pulled the shield out of the trunk, and strapped it to my forearm. Then I turned and strode to the staircase, taking the asphalt in long strides. A red, white, and blue Frankenstein monster. It's hard to describe what it feels like to walk out into the light of day and have every human you walk by rush to your side. To shout with glee and beg for photos, or take them without any permission at all. You cosplayers out there know this feeling well. For me, it was foreign and shocking on all fronts. It took me half an hour to just get across the street to the hospital entrance. By the time I arrived at the check-in area, I was in a state of shock and sweating so fiercely I felt like I was strapped into a wet mattress. After a series of photo ops with my fellow heroes, Black Widow, Batman, Star-Lord, we piled into the elevator and headed up to the children's treatment wing. I'm not ashamed to say that I was terrified. I felt like I was going to faint, like my body was disconnected from my brain and it was just going through the motions. Legs walk, arms swing, head move. Smile, smile, smile. A nurse stopped and asked if she could get me anything. I wanted to tell her I needed a few inches. Thick, long, blonde hair, blue eyes, toned and rippled muscles, and please, oh please, a shot of that special blue serum. I settled on a feeble water. I was barely able to reach my arm to my mouth, but I drained the bottle in seconds. How is it that our heroes on the page and screen barely ever drink water? You'd think they'd need to stuff cases of it into the Quinjet, have a tank strapped to the bat plane, web containers of it in alleys all over the city. There was a rumbling sound in the distance down the hall. They were coming our way. A herd of children, desperate to meet their comic book heroes. We all girded ourselves, striking our perfect poses. And there they were. Some tiny, holding a nurse's hand, some dressed in costumes, some connected to IV poles they dragged at their sides, some with bald heads and face masks, some in wheelchairs. We looked at one another, a group of part-time heroes, all of us just making do with what we had to work with so we could bring at least a small shred of belief to these children's lives. We turned to them, and in unison, we shouted our battle cry, Trick or treat! We were surrounded instantly, and a gaggle of little hands wrapped on my shield and pulled at my boots. Captain America! they yelled. And suddenly, I was completely present and accounted for. This body was mine. This suit was mine. This shield was mine. I choose to be him. Not Steve Rogers, not Winter Soldier, not John Walker or Sam Wilson or Isaiah Bradley, not Daniela Cage or Shannon Carter or America Chavez. Judd Myers. A little girl stared up at me, big round eyes beaming, Can I take a picture with you, Captain America? You bet, I bellowed. And then it began to dawn on me. I realized that if I bent down... Oh, faithful listener, if I bent down, the zipper would break, the clothing would flow, the belt would loosen, the pants would fall to my knees, I'd trip over my big oversized boots and probably crush a dozen sick children on my way to the floor. So I used my not-at-all heightened intellect and bent the math in my favor. I grabbed the little girl and lifted her into the crook of my arm. She draped over the unbearably heavy shield and smiled as wide as the moon and the nurses captured their photos. Me next! Now me! One after another they came. One after another I lifted, and lifted, and lifted. I don't exactly know how I held out as long as I did. All I can think is that I knew there was a mission to be accomplished, and there was absolutely no way that I was going to fail. This was why I was here. Not just in this costume or in this hospital on this earth. You can deny who you are. You can deny what you need. But you can't deny your calling. A call to service. 
like the heroes we love so very much. We are here to be of service to one another, and draped in three simple colors, charged with the honor of holding an ideal in my hands for a single afternoon, I was called to that service. The children started to drift off back to their rooms, quickly exhausted by the effort and excitement. And then, from around the corner, a hospital bed appeared. The nurses at either end slowly pushed the little girl wrapped up in the blankets toward us. This is Phoebe, the nurse whispered to me. She just got out of surgery, so she's very weak. She's got a lot of drugs in her, so I'm not sure how long she can stay away. When we told her you were here, she insisted that we bring her out into the hallway. She wanted to meet you so badly. We're all here for her, I said. The nurse gently touched my arm. Not them, she said. Just you. She led me to Phoebe's bedside, her tiny, pale body sunken into the mattress. Her head was bald, her eyebrows non-existent. The whole of her upper body was slathered in a kind of Vaseline, and her pillows were matted and damp. There were shades of red stains on different areas of her gown and sheets. An IV ran fluids into two different areas of her wrist and arm. Phoebe whispered something so quiet that I couldn't hear it beneath my helmet. I looked at the nurse, and she nodded her head in approval. I lifted my shield up above the metal framework of her bed put my hand softly on her shoulder and leaned in close. Phoebe stared deep into my eyes, and a smile snuck out from behind the wreckage. She reached up, her hand shaking, and touched my chin. She extended her fingers as long as she could and put them on my shield. They ran down the entire face of its curved steel, the star in the center almost as big as her body. America, she whispered. Her hand slid down to her side and she started to drift away. I grabbed a fistful of comic books and spread them gently all around her, a cocoon of heroes fighting alongside her. I looked down at this beautiful little girl, this girl braver than I will ever be in this short life, this girl more powerful than any serum. This girl whose will and strength of spirit made sure she refused to give up, to give in. This girl with more fight in her bones and in her heart than any hero in any comic book ever brought to the page. America, I whispered to her, and they took her away. Later, I would stand in a parking lot, crying as I carefully laid the shield into my trunk. I would slowly take off my coat of arms and fold it respectfully into its case. I would stand in my t-shirt and stare at my thin arms that somehow held a score of children for hours. Later, I would find myself driving on quiet roads, windows open, repeating the word Phoebe whispered, the one with the power to shake worlds or heal wounds, the one not open to interpretation when approached with the open hand and heart with which it was formed, as innocent as a tiny girl in a hospital bed. Not a costume at all, it turns out. Just a word. A symbol. A message carried in a uniform, handed from one human to another, decade to decade, on the page and off, on the screen and in real life. Every now and again I catch a glimpse of myself in the mirror. I tilt my head from side to side and stand up straight. I look past the gray in my beard and thinning hair on my head. A picture forms around me, and my thoughts drift to Phoebe. A look in her eyes, and the power of her spirit. On that day, in that brief moment, she believed I was her Captain America. And on that day, in that brief moment, I believed it too.
The Blast Off Podcast is produced by The Colonel, Jeff Fox, Scott Tipton, and me. Original music is composed and performed by Derek Anthony Gray. You can find more of his musical compositions on his website, DerekAnthonyGray.com. For more information about anything you've heard us talk about today, check us out online at BlastOffComics.com. We have an active Facebook presence, so check us out over there on Facebook. And you can reach us on Twitter, at BlastOffComics, or on Instagram. Or you can come by our retail location in North Hollywood in the heart of the Arts District, 5118 Lancashire Boulevard in North Hollywood, just two blocks south of Magnolia. See you soon. Thank you.